So you might think that uh, looking for dark energy or cosmic acceleration in the microwave background is looking for the tail of the whale, and that's true. For ordinary dark energy, uh, it is not the most sensitive probe of ordinary dark energy. Um, but uh, that depends on what's lurking beneath the surface. So as I'll tell you in uh, the first part of the talk, if you thought cosmic acceleration comes from something else, like uh, brain world uh, modifications to gravity, in fact, that's the final nail in the coffin for the so-called DGP brain world cosmology. The ISW effect from the microwave background is what's killing that idea of what cosmic acceleration could be. So it depends on what's lurking under the water, and I think um, we don't have a good model for cosmic acceleration right now. We don't have any compelling models for cosmic acceleration. And as Tristan uh, also emphasized in his talk yesterday, um, we need to measure these things on very, very different scales and very, very different regimes because there could be surprises lurking under the water. The other thing that I uh, want to use this slide from, this is of course from our excursion, is that two sigma, so if you have a large memory card and you snap 20 pictures, you're going to get one two sigma event of the tail of the whale. So don't take, if you've measured a lot of things about uh, cosmic acceleration, don't take one of them uh, as a two sigma fluctuation too seriously, because you're always going to get that. And in fact, you get more than, you usually get more than 5% uh, two sigma because of unexpected effects. <clears throat> So in fact, uh, there were more tails of the whales than a one out of 20 in the, uh, the memory card. All right, here we go. So uh, we're marching down in redshift. We went through uh, reionization first. Then we went through the intermediate redshifts where you had gravitational lensing. Uh, and the important things there were the generation of B modes, uh, both from reionization as an opportunity to measure gravitational waves, uh, distortion of the E mode from um, the last scattering surface at recombination, giving you B modes from lensing, giving you the opportunity to reconstruct the mass distribution between us and redshift of 1,000. And now we're marching down uh, in redshift toward the acceleration epoch. And uh, we're there. All right, and this is to remind you what the various effects we covered are on the scattering side. In the uh, last part of the talk, I'll tell you about the nonlinear parts of the modulated Doppler effect, which is the kinetic sunyev zoldovich effect, and the thermal sunyev zoldovich effect from the second order Doppler effect in uh, scattering microwave background photons and hot gas. Let's start with the gravitational secondaries. We talked about lensing in uh, the second lecture, and now we're going to talk about what's happening here on the large angle, largest angles, um, a signature of the dark energy in the universe or the cosmic acceleration phase. And then there's also the nonlinear aspects, which I'll just uh, touch on. All right, so what is the integrated Sachs Wolf effect? Well, the photons are climbing in and out of the gravitational potentials from uh, the recombination surface all the way to the present. And as, um, as we discussed in, the, in Eric's uh, talks, and uh, actually in many of the lectures, if you have a smooth component to the uh, energy density and it's driving the expansion rate, uh, you're going to get a decay in the gravitational potential, right? You're going to lack the source of inhomogeneity in the Poisson equation that gives you the gravitational potential that matches um, the effect on the expansion rate. So what happens in the acceleration epoch for ordinary dark energy is the gravitational potential decays. You have two effects in the microwave background. You have the photon getting blue shifted as it goes down into the gravitational potential and cosmic acceleration occurs. This, these are very, very long wavelength modes. So these are horizon scale modes. Um, and by the time it climbs out, the gravitational potential has changed and it lacks the corresponding redshift, getting a net blue shift in a gravitational potential well. You get a second effect, um, which you can think of as a metric uh, stretching effect, that is the wavelength of photons in the presence of the spatial curvature of gravitational potential well will change. And if that decays, you get a, a, a doubling of the effect from uh, 
the distortion of the wavelength. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let, me, um, let me just write down what I said in the, in the discussion of that picture. That is, if you have some sort of energy component that is smooth and is driving the expansion, you get a change in the gravitational potential, right, just by the Poisson equation. So a smooth component contributes in the Friedman equation. It contributes rho to uh, the background metric, but it does not contribute to the metric fluctuations uh, through the Poisson equation. And that means that you'll get a, um, uh, a change in the gravitational potential that is a decay. The other thing to note is that uh, by energy momentum conservation, you can't retain a smooth component of energy density on scales larger than the horizon, right? Um, so energy momentum conservation tells you that on very, very large scales, uh, a, a microphysical component of dark energy must have fluctuations unless it is a cosmological constant, unless it is spatially constant and time invariant. Uh, that's the only way you get a purely smooth dark energy component. So there has to be a transition scale between these two. And formally, if you're doing perturbation theory, this is the statement that regardless of the equation of state, the Bardeen curvature, the curvature on co-moving uh, slices is constant. Now, in the Newtonian metric, there is a dependence on the uh, equation of state, we'll see. But it still gives you a difference between the superhorizon behavior and the smooth behavior. In other words, the dark energy has a gene scale unless it's a cosmological constant. <clears throat> and that's an interesting signature uh, for the microphysics of dark energy that the microwave background is sort of uniquely um, able to do by measuring the largest scales where we think the gene scale of the dark energy might be. Okay, so let's go back to this picture. What's happening in terms of where the ISW effect is contributing in redshift and in spatial scale. Well, we have the contributions from recombination out here. Here is redshift one and below. And the thing to note here are two things. One is that the source from the ISW effect is coming from a much closer distance. That means that uh, it's a shorter wavelength that projects onto the same angle on the sky. And we'll see where it probes in terms of the the power spectrum, what happens in a, the next slide. And the other thing to note is this limber cancellation, right? So if I have contributions all through this thick surface and I have a very short wavelength fluctuation, well, when I'm looking down this way, all of the red shifts and blue shifts cancel. And that's why even with a scale invariant gravitational potential spectrum on large scales and a scale invariant change in the growth rate, I get a very scale-dependent integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. I get something that's falling in L, unlike the Sachs-Wolf effect, which was flat in L. <clears throat> All right, so where is it contributing in uh, terms of spatial wavelengths? In terms of spatial wavelengths for the same angle, and I've plotted out the quadrupole because you probably know the quadrupole is particularly interesting in the data where it's contributing in spatial scales. So for the Sachs-Wolf stuff at uh, recombination, it's contributing around the horizon scale. No surprise, the horizon distance is um, close to the distance to the recombination surface. The integrated Sachs-Wolf effect is coming from a bunch of spatial scales, but all smaller than uh, the horizon because of this nearer distance to the acceleration epoch. So it's probing things of the order of 10 to the minus 3 in K. Uh, its weight is actually here, whereas the Sachs-Wolf weight is here. Here are those projection oscillations from the, the Bessel function or looking at a plane wave on the sphere. That's not going to be in the ISW, right, because it's contributing a thick surface, and you're getting all of the, uh, you're, get, you're integrating through that Bessel function and all the limber cancellation, getting a smooth contribution. So this is interesting for things like uh, the anomalies in the CMB, right? If you, want, if you thought you could solve the so-called low quadrupole problem, which is not really a problem, it's a less than two sigma uh, event in lambda CDM. Um, it's not really a, a big statistical fluke if you account for we've measured all of the multiples. It's just a surprise that it happens at the first multiple we can measure. <clears throat> 
Um, this is the tough part for a, a theoretical explanation involving either dark energy, initial conditions, what have you, um, because it comes from two very, very different spatial scales. So half of the contribution to the quadrupole comes from small spatial scales, a tenth of the horizon, the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect for a lambda CDM cosmology. Half of it comes from the large scale stuff on the recombination surface. So if you thought you could truncate the initial power spectrum to get rid of the quadrupole, no, you can only get rid of half of it. If you thought you could change the dark energy to get rid of it, well, you're only getting rid of half of it. <clears throat> and this is just to show you that if uh, you look at the polarization, the secondary polarization nicely complements that. It's from scattering uh, on scales that are associated with uh, the reionization horizon, and uh, it's purely on these long wavelength scales that you get contributions to the quadrupole. So that helps you, right, because you can distinguish. This is one way you could infer what's going on in the ISW effect, even if you can't separate it just from the temperature fluctuations, because um, uh, its contribution isolates the stuff that's really on the recombination surface. It's looking at the quadrupole moments at redshift of 1,000 to generate scattering. <clears throat> and this is also just to show you that uh, this was WMAP1, so this went all the way out to redshift 17. But most of the contribution to the quadrupole is in the region where we know the universe is fully ionized. So there's very little uncertainty, as I showed you in the first lecture, in what the quadrupole and polarization can be uh, given the um, lambda CDM model. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> all right, so um, <clears throat> let's, let's take a look at uh, what the effect is sensitive to. So um, if you go beyond quintessence and you think of what is actually testing about the dark energy, can it do things like falsify quintessence? Well, it could have a weak probe of that because it's sensitive to where the clustering of the dark energy occurs, that is this gene scale of the dark energy. If you like, you can phrase this in terms of a sound speed and the sound speed of quintessence, scalar ordinary canonical term, uh, scalar field dark energy, the sound speed is one, the speed of light, and this gene scale happens on the horizon scale. <clears throat> so let's take a look at that. Quintessence first. So quintessence, this is the change in um, uh, the ISW effect, just ramping up the cosmological constant. This is what happens if you change the equation of state. There are dramatic effects if you change the equation of state so much that you're approaching an equation of state that has a, a matter-like component. And this is also what happens for early dark energy. If you have a small residual component here, you have early ISW effect. You have stuff coming in uh, all the way out to, um, to recombination. And you get a large distortion. This is why the microwave background actually is a very good way of constraining the fraction of uh, um, the fraction of the energy density in dark energy uh, at epochs near recombination. But if you have an equation of state where it mainly goes away, it appears only on these large scales. <clears throat> Are you considering only a, a constant equation of state? This is an example of a constant equation of state, but you know the same effect applies so long as there's uh, a significant fraction of the energy density in a smooth component. So it's matter-like in the background expansion. It's smooth in the perturbations on scales below the horizon. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the, the difference between the superhorizon behavior and the subhorizon behavior. It basically is a transition, right? On very, very large scales, you have, uh, given an equation of state, you have one sort of behavior. It's just conservation of energy momentum. And by the way, this is also true for modified gravity, as I'll talk about uh, next, but with another, one more degree of freedom. But basically, conservation of energy momentum and the background metric, that is what you're doing to the expansion rate, determines what's going on on large scales. On small scales, smooth, this assumption of smoothness tells you that it is, again, just a function of the equation of state. And the only thing left there is a transition scale, which you can parameterize as a sound speed. <clears throat> in terms of scalar fields, this is k-essence. This is uh, something where you modify the kinetic term in the Lagrangian for the scalar field. 
<coughs> All right. And how, what does it do to the microwave background? It changes this ISW effect because you can get more clustering for the same dark energy equation of state and uh, reduce the decay of the potential and change the ISW effect if you change this clustering scale. <coughs> now, um, well, I'll mention that later. All right, so um, <coughs> that's good, but remember we're cosmic variance limited here. We only have five measurements of a quadrupole, so we can't actually measure, even though this deviation is a factor of two, it's very hard to measure uh, these, large, these large angles, low multiples, accurately just because of statistics, just because we only have one sky. So how else do you detect the uh, ISW effect? Um, so it has been detected in the cross correlation with galaxies. That is, you have these gravitational potential wells, which um, are tr the, the galaxies track through uh, the large scale structure of the universe. And so if you correlate a galaxy survey with the microwave background, you can extract out the, the correlated piece is the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. <clears throat> and here's um, <coughs> the slide from Shirley. Go ask her about the data analysis details. Uh, this is just normalized to lambda CDM with a bunch of redshift surveys here, probing different redshifts to see consistency with lambda CDM. It's uh, two sigma high uh, compared with lambda CDM, so we either got lucky and and um, so it made it easier to detect is one thing. Uh, the initial projections before the data came out were a little more pessimistic and, um, and the uh, signal was actually a little stronger than you would expect on average. But it's only two sigma high from lambda CDM. <clears throat> the y-axis uh, y -axis is just normalized to the signal expected from lambda CDM just so you're not plotting a correlation function for each point. But it's, uh, it's another factor of another decade from the quadrupole, so L of 20 ish. <clears throat> All right, so what's the ultimate limit of this? Um, so if you had a very, really, really deep survey, how well could you do on this? Uh, it turns out it, it's, you'll get about an eight sigma detection. You'll convert something that is uh, nominally a four sigma detection to an eight sigma detection. And that's because you're limited by the microwave background itself. We still only have one microwave background sky no matter how many galaxies you have. <clears throat> but um, that, that does help. That uh, would allow you to place interesting constraints on the clustering of dark energy, for example. So anyway, this is just a setup of, um, you know, if you could probe all the way out in redshift, what would happen? And here's, here's probably a better picture of what you're actually measuring. You're measuring the cross-correlation between the temperature and the galaxy field, right? And uh, at different redshifts, it peaks in different places. So if you're at some intermediate redshift, it was around L of 20-ish that you're probing. But that depends on uh, what your selection function is. Okay, And this is the effect. The difference between having a, a, a component of dark energy that clusters at a tenth of the um, horizon versus the horizon. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> so you can phrase it into the sound speed. Uh, I, th I think probably the better way to phrase this is how well are we testing the dark energy is smooth because it, phrasing it in the sound speed um, is sort of de a degenerate thing because at a cosmological constant, it doesn't matter what I assign the sound speed is, a cosmological constant is a constant. Um, and um, <clears throat> you would get no spatial fluctuations. So, <clears throat> if, <clears throat> sorry, phrasing it in terms of the sound speed makes the constraints depend on uh, the choice of W I have here, the equation of state, and it gets weaker as you go close to a cosmological constant. But the bottom line is it tests how smooth the dark energy is, so here is just a projection of the ultimate limit, having an all-sky galaxy survey and a cosmic variance limited CMB survey. You can say probe that the uh, uh, test that the dark energy is smooth to say 3% out to a gigaparsec, and you can read off this plot uh, how smooth 
um, how smooth the, the dark energy would have to be uh, to satisfy measurements. You know, this is, this is a Fisher matrix, so I'm assuming lambda CEM is correct and seeing how well you could test it's correct in terms of not the dark energy equation of state, but the smoothness of the dark energy. <clears throat> All right. Um, and then I just want to remind you that, uh, that even if it is an equation of state of minus one, you could still have non-smooth dark energy, right? If you can have dynamically non-smooth dark energy, but you can get arbitrarily close to a cosmological constant with a scalar field and still have scalar field fluctuations if you put them in at the initial conditions and had them in a frozen, uh, you know, a, a frozen scalar field uh, and had them survive all the way to uh, the present. I don't think there's much motivation for this, but it's a curiosity that you can still have isocurvature modes in the dark energy. It can still do things like lower the quadrupole if you thought that that was a problem. It's not a statistically significant thing that, uh, you, 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 there's no evidence for, for this, but the, these sorts of effects are still allowed. Uh, and in this example, what happens is that you have a correlated isocurvature piece that cancels out the adiabatic piece, leaves you with no Sachs-Wolf effect after acceleration. There is still a, a fluctuations uh, on the last scattering surface before. Um, so the, uh, the electrons at reionization still see a Sachs-Wolf effect. They still generate a polarization. So the polarization comes through just as usual, but then uh, and during the acceleration epoch, you have a cancellation of uh, the Sachs-Wolf effect, and you have um, a reduction here. You still have the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect because it's still a scalar field, and it still has um, a sound speed. So uh, it does things like lower the large angle fluctuations by getting rid of half of the contribution, uh, and the nice thing is it does not lower the polarization. So WMAP has significant detections of polarization at large angles. You cannot do things like cut off the power spectrum to get rid of uh, the Sachs-Wolf effect that way because you would get rid of polarization. And I'll show you that's the final nail in the coffin for uh, the Diwali Gabadadze Parati brain world model in a second. Uh, and this is just to show you the polarization. Polarization is the same, cross-correlation is of course different. So anyway, uh, that's just to remind you that even if you're approaching the equation of state of a cosmological constant, you could still have interesting behave, spatial behavior of the dark energy, uh, even for a scalar field cosmology, even for scalar field dark energy. So what else might be lurking under the water uh, to make the microwave background more interesting in terms of probing the properties of cosmic acceleration? Um, so instead of having a dark energy component, you could suppose that we just don't understand something about gravity on the largest scales. <clears throat> and um, you can always phrase a modification of gravity as if it were a dark energy component. Um, so in some sense, you know, we're not distinguishing a modification of gravity independently of what we think the universe is composed of, because there's always, there is always the formal statement that you could take Einstein's equations, um, modify them, put some other function of the metric here, and just move this over to the right-hand side. It would still obey, it's still a metric theory, it still obeys Bianchi identities, it still conserves energy and momentum, and in fact, this extra component also still is conserved, right? So uh, it was still, since this guy is conserved, and this guy obeys the Bianchi identity, it obeys covariant conservation or local conservation of what I'm assigning as an effective energy density for a modification of gravity. So one thing to bear in mind is when people tell you they're testing gravity, they're not testing gravity directly. They're testing gravity plus an assumption of what the components of the matter and energy in the universe are. For a modification of gravity, what happens is, yes, I can do it formally. I can put it on the right-hand side, and that actually helps. I'll show you that you can use all your standard cosmological tools because of this nice, you know, this, this nice way of phrasing it as if it were dark energy. But the price you pay for that is you introduce something that is an effective coupling between the dark energy and the dark matter. That is, you can't just independently think of what the, you can think of the matter as falling in the metric, 
as usual, geodesics of the metric, but those have changed, right? So if you're thinking about it <coughs> as an effective dark energy, you've introduced an effective interaction between the dark matter and the dark energy. <coughs> and um, the proof of principle uh, models for this sort of thing are uh, brain world modifications to gravity, matter modifications of the action. And I'm in the class of people who would put this on equal footing. <laughs> I know I'm in dangerous ground with Eric here. I think of all of these as just toy models. I don't think anyone has come up with a compelling explanation of cosmic acceleration. We're playing with these toy models in both cases to understand what we're probing about cosmic acceleration in either case is my perspective of that. So I don't, I don't think I, any of these options are fundamental explanations of uh, cosmic acceleration yet, but they're helping us understand what we're testing in the observations. <clears throat> All right, I want to go through this a little bit because this is an example where the microwave background, which you might have thought of as a terrible probe of cosmic acceleration, is the nail in the coffin for an idea of what cosmic acceleration could come from. So here's the Diwali, Gabadazi, Parati brain world acceleration. I don't want to really go into the details of this, but you have an extra dimension. You have a different Newton's constant in the extra dimension than on, in our world, uh, and that provides uh, an ability to self-accelerate. That is, um, you probe um, the 5D gravity if you go beyond a certain scale, which is just the ratio of uh, the, uh, the gravitational strength, uh, Newton's constant in the bulk and on the brain. Um, and this is the, the reason why the microwave background is so important for testing this model. That is, you set this scale by hand, so it doesn't solve coincidence or fine tuning in that sense. You have a parameter just like lambda that's set to the energy scale, the, the scale of the horizon today, right? And that means that if you want to do something order unity to gravity on the horizon scale, the best place to look to test that sort of idea is what's happening on the horizon scale, what's happening to fluctuations on the horizon scale that you test in uh, the microwave background. Um, so there are three regimes to this model, and it's interesting that the largest scale regime, which in fact is the same sort of argument that we did for clustered dark energy, it's just conservation of energy momentum, and I showed you in the last slide that uh, you can view this dark energy component exactly, you can view this modification of gravity exactly as a dark energy component. It's still covariantly conserved in the metric. It still obeys things like Bardeen curvature conservation. That puts a structure on it. The Newtonian side of things has one extra degree of freedom, which is uh, the gamma parameter that Tristan introduced, the effective anisotropic stress uh, that you assign to this uh, modification of gravity. And formally, that comes from the vial tensor in, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in this model. OK, enough introduction of that. OK, what happens uh, to um, the fluctuations in DGP? This is the combination of uh, the space, the Newtonian potential, and the space curvature that photons feel, gravitational redshift, and gravitational lensing. You have an extra decay of the gravitational potential because you're approaching this crossover scale and seeing the extra dimensional physics. And it's important here that you, you solve all of the bulk equations. So it's not just you know, introducing a scale independent change in the growth rate on the brain. That does not work. You would miss the effect if you did that. Uh, so you have to take into account that um, these modifications of gravity have a scale dependence. And on large scales, in this model, you see an enhancement of the effect, an enhancement of the decay of the gravitational potential, which gives you a, a large ISW effect. And even trying to compromise with the data, you can't, because what happens is you need something to fit, you need some uh, restricted range of parameters to fit acceleration, the supernovae data. So when you combine supernovae, the distance to last scattering, and uh, if you just did that, and looked at the best fit model, it would actually predict a quadrupole in the CMB that was about half the height of uh, the first acoustic peak. That, of course, is way, way outside the um, data, which is actually below lambda CDM's prediction by um, uh, a sigma and a half or so. <clears throat> well, it depends on how you phrase it. In this, case, in this way of looking at it, it's about a two sigma 
uh, problem. But in any case, this really exacerbates it. And when you do the um, likelihood analysis, it actually tries to compromise and lower this at the expense of making the distances bad. Uh, in any case, it's a five sigma problem now. So uh, at five sigma, it cannot fit the distances from supernovae and the CMB and the growth of structure that you see in the ISW effect. And note that this is enhanced versus what you would naively do just by introducing a change in the growth rate that affects large-scale structure, because it's a horizon scale thing. So if I had done that, I wouldn't have ruled out this model. Um, I wouldn't have added much more significance by uh, adding in the ISW constraint. If I do it properly and follow the perturbations out into the bulk, I get a much larger effect. <clears throat> OK, and this is a final uh, nail, which is, you know, you, that was for a scale-free initial power spectrum. So can I save this model by just introducing extra knobs, right? I, what if I change the initial power spectrum to try and get rid of the fluctuations? Now here's where that secondary polarization comes in, right? So if I cut off the, um, cut off the initial fluctuations to get rid of the large-scale stuff to try to reduce the ISW effect here, I can do it in the temperature field. I can lower this, make it a better fit to WMAP. But WMAP also measures the polarization, and I showed you where it was coming from in spatial scale. If I try to truncate the ISW effect, I've gotten rid of all of the Sachs-Wolf effect. I've gotten rid of the whole reionization bump in this case. And when you do the likelihood analysis, this is, is strongly disfavored. That is, uh, it can't explain the WMAP reionization um, points no matter what the ionization history is. So this is the final nail in the coffin. I can't even add epicycles, like changing, tweaking the initial power spectrum to make a designer model here. It really is inconsistent with uh, the dynamics and inconsistent with um, having uh, polarization in the microwave background on large scales. All right, so that's an example where the ISW effect, which you thought in lambda CDM was very, uh, a very weak probe of cosmic acceleration, turns out to be one of the strongest tests of uh, this alternate explanation of cosmic acceleration. So what about um, the other example? Uh, the other example was introduced by Tristan yesterday. This is the modified action idea that maybe we can generalize what Einstein did, which um, is add a constant here, a cosmological constant, and generalize that into um, a function of the Ricci scalar. This is called the F of R model. Uh, it has a long history for trying to uh, generate cosmic acceleration. It was one of the earliest inflationary models, probably the earliest inflationary model, if you modified this function to get high curvature effects. And then, um, uh, Carroll and company and a few other groups uh, tried to use this for um, cosmic acceleration at late times by just changing the uh, uh, functional dependence so that it appears at low curvature. I'm not going to go through this in detail. Tristan actually introduced this in greater detail than I will. Uh, there's an extra propagating degree of freedom here, which is associated with the derivative of this function, and it obeys something uh, like a Klein-Gordon equation with a potential with uh, a mass term, which is the second derivative here. And that gives you the range of this modification of gravity. What happens is there's an e extra attractive force on scales below the Compton wavelength of this uh, effective scalar. And uh, in terms of cosmology, the interesting thing to try to test is um, how is that compared with the Hubble length? So the initial ideas for trying to generate cosmic acceleration tried to set this scale at the Hubble length. And that, of course, is very bad because you modify gravity all the way for all scales below the Hubble length. And there's no way to save things like solar system tests of gravity if you do that. <clears throat> but these models are still alive in the sense that the closer you get to a constant here, the closer you get to a cosmological constant phenomenology. <clears throat> what happens here to the ISW effect? Well, if I set that scale near the horizon, if I think that there are deviations in this gamma parameter, that is the ratio of space curvature, the, you know, the space curvature per unit mass in a PPN sense, um, on scales that are approaching the horizon, 
In this model, what happens is I have an extra force, which enhances the growth of structure, changes a decay into a growth, and that's something that is very, very distinct in the ISW correlation, right? So if I change the sign of this effect, I've made galaxies instead of correlated with a microwave background, I've made them <laughs> anti-correlated with a microwave background. <clears throat> I, I also change the large-scale behavior of the CLs, the power spectrum. Oops, what did I just do? Right. So here's the data in a different representation. Correlation function on six degrees. <clears throat> uh, uh, not exactly six degrees, but weighted around six degrees. In terms of uh, galaxy surveys, you've probed this in redshift. The one thing, thing that I want in this plot is that they're all correlation measurements. In fact, they're a little higher than lambda CDM, as, uh, as I discussed earlier. But they're definitely not anti-correlation. So to the significance with which you've detected a positive correlation, you know there can't be deviations to this um, uh, this sort of, this sign deviations to the uh, space curvature generated per unit mass, or in this case, this Compton wavelength of the modification of gravity uh, on scales that are approaching the horizon. <clears throat> and you can phrase this in that model independent sense of a PPN parameter. This is gamma that Tristan introduced. How well are we testing gravity? Well, it's an order unity test of gravity. But it's an order unity test of gravity on the horizon scale at redshifts uh, or, uh, below one. And that's an interesting complement to what we already know about gravity. That's the largest scales in the universe. And we've tested, um, uh, we've tested gravity in that sense to, um, to something that looks in this sort of plot where uh, you know, units of gamma, deviations from gamma on the solar system are 10 to the minus 5, and I'm plotting something that's order unity here, but it's on a vastly different scale. And better yet, things that are sort of natural explanations of cosmic acceleration, which try to do things on the whole Hubble volume, you might think naturally change the perturbations uh, on a similar scale. And we saw that was the case of DGP. That's the case of F of R as well, but solar system tests are more important for F of R and they squeeze you into a different region of parameter space. But in a model where you're just trying to put in one scale in the problem, the Hubble scale today or the cosmological constant scale, then you might expect the deviations from gravity to turn up in the infrared, and the microwave background is our unique probe of the infrared, the largest scales in the universe. All right, so um, that's enough for the linear ISW effect. I'll just uh, mention, I don't think I even need to show the movie anymore. This was a movie of structure formation and halos, but um, you've seen much better simulations now. <clears throat> so let me just say that there's a nonlinear analog to this. That is, uh, a dark matter halo could move across the line of sight and change the potential that the photon is traveling on a geodesic is, uh, is probing, and that also gives you a differential redshift effect. But this time, you know, all structures in the universe still have gravitational potentials that are less than 10 to, 10 to minus 5. So you don't get a vast enhancement from uh, the more developed structure. And you still have things like the limber cancellation. Uh, so it, it, um, it's a small effect, and I won't comment any more on this, uh, just to show you the sort of typical level of an effect like that. <clears throat> now let's move on to the uh, sunyev zoldovich effect, uh, and that's the last topic I want to cover. How am I doing on time? OK. All right, so the first thing is the kinetic SC effect, and Shirley Ho was talking about this yesterday. Uh, remember, there was this problem that the background, the, the homogeneous Doppler effect from just scattering in a uniform a medium with linear theory velocities suffers a severe cancellation on small scales because uh, the stuff that survives the limber approximation is transverse modes across the sky. Transverse modes across the sky have no uh, component of velocity pointing toward you. Right? OK, and this is just to remind you that uh, all of that was the same thing as the K kinetic SZ effect. So if I replace the ionization giving you enhanced scattering and the linear density field giving you less scattering, that's the patchy reionization effect, and the linear, the Ostreicher-Vishniak effect in, for linear density fluctuations, 
and replace that with uh, halos of dark matter, uh, in particular clusters, um, you would get uh, a modulated Doppler effect, which this time is just picking out very localized regions, the, the halos of galaxies, uh, so, sorry, the halos of clusters. <clears throat> and, uh, whoops, I guess I didn't plot the effect. On the, on the big plot of all the scattering effects, that's what I was calling the nonlinear modulated density effect. That is, if you take a halo model, throw in some uh, description of the gas, uh, that, that enhancement at uh, small, high multiple moments, arc minute scales, was from accounting for the nonlinear structure in the universe through a halo model. <clears throat> now, the final thing that I want to talk about is the thermal SC effect. So uh, remember, this cancellation uh, in the limber approximation had to do with velocities pointing toward you, pointing away from you, integrating across that, getting nothing to first order, uh, no Doppler effect to first order. So what happens if I go to higher order? That's uh, so, and I look at not the coherent motion of, uh, of the electrons, but the thermal motion, well, I get the thermal SC effect. The thermal SC effect is a second order Doppler effect. <clears throat> oh, I just had it out of order. So this, this is the stuff from the nonlinear structure. This is the ostriker vishniak effect from the linear density field. And now I'm going to talk about this contribution, which is the thermal SC effect. <clears throat> All right. so. Let me just remind you of some basics. We usually think of Thompson scattering as you know, ping pong balls uh, on, on uh, bowling balls and elastic scattering, not changing the energy of the photon. We know that can't really happen, right? If a photon bounces uh, right backwards, I can't conserve energy and momentum um, if, uh, if I don't have a recoil of the uh, uh, electron. And you know this sort of thing must be true, right? Because it must be the case that if I had a hot electron gas, this scattering is the beginning of a thermalization process. It must be exchanging energy at some level. And it must eventually uh, get into um, uh, kinetic equilibrium. Um, and how does that happen? And what are the, the two ways that you exchange uh, energy between the photons and the electrons? One is from recoil. The second one is from the second order Doppler effect. I think I'm running out of time, so I just will, you know, I have, I have math, <laughs> if you want math. Uh, simple kinematics, you can look at the energy of the incoming photon with respect to the outgoing photon to see how the energy transfer works. It's just simple kinematics of scattering, scattering angles and, um, uh, and velocities of the uh, electron coming in here. What I want to just emphasize is there are two terms here. Easy, this is the fully relativistic thing. This is what gives you in, inverse Compton scattering. Uh, but in the non-relativistic limit, non-relativistic electron velocities, it's very easy to understand. There's a recoil effect. And you can just see this by looking at the change in momentum from the scattering back, uh, um, scattering exactly backwards, right? Where it's really easy to figure out the change in momentum. This is the recoil effect and what happens to the photon. The second piece is the Stoppler thing. I wanted to go this in a little more detail because there actually was a question about this in the first lecture. What happens is you, uh, it, it, why did I call it a Doppler effect, right? Um, so I'm going into the rest frame of the electron. It's Thompson scattering in the frame of the electron. So I do a transformation in there, get a Doppler uh, shift from that, and I get a Doppler shift back out, right? So those are the two incoming and outgoing uh, transformations. They would, uh, <clears throat> if you have random velocity fields, they would cancel. But to second order, uh, if you just expand out the Doppler formula, you have a second order contribution here. Uh, that is the energy exchange. So one term is uh, giving energy to the photon. One term is taking it away. And this is a thermalization process. All right, And you can put in thermal distribution for the electrons to see what kind of effect you have per scattering, and basically you're comparing the temperature of the electrons to the typical energy of the photons. This is a black body. This is just going to be the temperature of the photons sitting here. And uh, it depends on whether the photons are hotter or the uh, electrons are hotter, which way the energy transfer goes. 
And I just wanted to show you the simple kinematics before telling you um, this, which is uh, the, um, the way you do this in a radio transfer or Boltzmann uh, equation sense is you uh, do Compton scattering to second order in the energy transfer. And that's called the compton aitz equation. But it's quite easy to understand scattering event by scattering event what happens. It's basically this ratio of temperature to the mass of the electron times the number of scatterings you have, the optical depth. That gives you the so-called Compton Y parameter uh, that tells you how energy is transferred. I won't bore you with the details, but it's here in the notes if you want them. <clears throat> the bottom line is uh, I get what I, um, I derived in sort of um, the kinematic sense from the, looking at the full Boltzmann equation for that, which is here's the optical depth factor, Thomson's cross-section energy uh, number density of the electrons, and the thing that weights that, the number of scatterings in terms of the fractional energy transfer rate, is uh, the difference in temperature of the electrons and the photons, and this is rest mass of the electron. And that's the Compton Y parameter. You can solve this. Um, rate equation. This is the beginning of a thermalization process. What happens is if you have a hot gas of electrons, um, it's uh, giving some energy to the photons, which in below the peak of the microwave background is actually depleting the photons on that side. So it's a deficit on, uh, on the Rayleigh genes tail of the microwave background, and giving energy, uh, boosting the energy um, which makes an enhancement on the Wien side of the um, microwave background spectrum. And uh, this is artificially large looking because remember in the Wien tail you have an exponential suppression, so it's really easy to get something large in temperature units, in thermodynamic temperature. Uh, if I let this process continue, this is the solution of the Compenates equation. Um, as you go through multiple scatterings, eventually you know you have to hit a chemical potential distortion, a mu distortion. Uh, why is it mu instead of a full thermalization to a black body? Compton scattering preserves the number of photons, so um, you can't reach a black body for uh, an initial distribution of photons. At some temperature, I have a given number density of photons that are just going to be the same at the end. And that means that it, after the, the process goes through many scatterings, what will happen is you get a Bose-Einstein distribution. All right, so anyway, the, the things for, uh, to keep in mind here are deficit, temperature fluctuation uh, in the Rayleigh genes side. Delta T over T is uh, minus 2Y. And uh, there's a null near uh, when you put back in the temperature of the microwave background near 220 gigahertz and an enhancement on the Wien side. So if you're looking on the Rayleigh gene side and looking through clusters of galaxies, you get a contribution to unresolved clusters of galaxies. You get a contribution to the power spectrum of the microwave background, and uh, it um, you know, has a characteristic scale associated with the halos that are contributing uh, in the thermal SC effect. It's an extraordinarily sensitive to the amplitude of fluctuations uh, because of this exponential in the mass function. It goes as sigma eight to the seven. It's not really necessary to show you this animation, but just to give you a visualization of this, as you change sigma eight from say 0.7 to one in the last phases of this, you really change the SC effect uh, uh, by a large power of sigma eight. <clears throat> Of course, you know what I'm previewing here. I'm previewing the CBI excess here, which is uh, the um, uh, excess over the primary anisotropy. Oh, I guess I sent the best plot, um, which could be the SC effect. I think stay tuned. So uh, the SCA will have something to say about this very, very soon, about whether the, um, the excess the CBI saw could be the uh, SC effect. But with a low sigma 8, you know, there's a tension here. With a, there's such a strong function of sig sigma 8. If sigma 8 were 0.9, then it's plausible that uh, you get a large contribution that explains some, some um, uh, excess for, that you see in CBI. By the way, the, the, this plot was showing that um, Akbar has tested that it's not a black body 
uh, spectrum that uh, uh, they don't they see it they don't see it uh, at a significant level, but they're at a higher frequency where the SC effect has um, uh, is nearer the null, so a smaller SC effect. So it's still consistent with SC in uh, Akbar, and uh, stay tuned for um, more information from more recent experiments. And then for the final bit, uh, I want to uh, just highlight uh, the other application to this. That is, if you resolve these um, contributions, the SC effect, into clusters, this is a way of detecting clusters. The nice thing is that you're looking at it in contrast with the microwave background, so it's independent of redshift. You can find all the clusters that are, exist. Of course, we don't think that clusters should exist uh, in large number densities above redshift 1, but if they do, the the yasinyev zoldovich effect would be a great way to find them. And that's been long. Uh, you should see Jack Sayers' talk uh, this afternoon, but you know, individual pointed observations to known clusters is, is reliably, uh, you can reliably measure the SC effect now. And just recently this uh, last fall, um, it's been successful in terms of discovering clusters. I think um, at least three of these were not known clusters before. This is just showing you at different frequencies, filtering out um, uh, the microwave background, background fluctuations, and looking at consistency between different frequencies, seeing nothing at that null frequency. Um, so it's, it's, uh, there are surveys going on to discover clusters, uh, however far out they exist in redshift. And this, of course, is useful uh, because of this exponential in the mass function here. That is, we're counting clusters. If we knew how to assign the mass of the cluster, this would be a great way to test dark energy. Here's just two equations of state. Changing the linear growth rate of structure would change the uh, amount of rare objects we see on this exponential tail. And the thing that uh, is the cautionary note is we don't get uh, mass directly. We have to find uh, proxies for the mass or measure the weak lensing mass. And that, you know, if, if a theorist tells you something from a Fisher matrix, beware, right? So if you didn't, if you had perfect knowledge of the, the, the mass, you could do extraordinarily well with counting SZ clusters. It was just a projection with, uh, I forgot how many thousand, but a few thousand clusters for the SPT survey. You could do great, but if you didn't know the masses, you don't get anything, right? So um, <clears throat> it depends on how well you know the masses, uh, in particular how, how biased you are on the average mass and what's the distribution given, say, a Compton Y decrement, what's the distribution of masses. Both are important. You're on this exponential. If you have scatter in your mass observable relationship, you take things that are low mass and scatter them into a high observable bin, and, uh, and that could look like dark energy. But I should say that there are lots of observables in clusters, including things that just come out of a single data set. You can measure the clustering of clusters. You can measure the shape of the, uh, the ob observable mass function, that is, the Compton Y function, or the, the richness function, or the, um, the temperature function. There are lots of handles on this. And the theory <laughs> okay, predicts this. Um, uh, consistency relationships, which you could use to calibrate the mass. And I'll, I'll end up with this as being currently probably the most powerful probe of this modified gravity type idea. So if you have an extra force, in this case, uh, as Tristan mentioned, it's dependent on the depth of the gravitational potential well. So my group has, I think, <laughs> conducted, not I think conducted, conducted the, the first cosmological simulations of uh, this modification to gravity. Um, and in this case, there's an extrascalar field, and it obeys a Klein-Gordon equation. In deep gravitational potential wells, you're sent back to Newtonian forces and general relativity. In shallow gravitational potential wells, you don't. This is just a picture of a the density contrast, the gravitational potential, and this deviation in the force uh, law. Um, and that provides you with an interesting perspective on what you're testing in gravity. So say you, say you did the, um, the minimal test of gravity, like Eric was mentioning, in terms of uh, throwing in a linear growth rate of structure, churning out the machinery to predict the, the abundance of clusters, well, you'd be making a big mistake there, right? In these models, clusters, 
which have deep gravitational potential wells, uh, eventually will not be the place to look. Right now, they are the place to look. But as we get closer, as our tests get finer and finer, um, in this model, the deep gravitational potential wells have uh, force laws that are uh, just Newtonian gravity. So uh, I don't think I gave you enough detail to understand this plot. But the things are, we're here now. Clusters would be great. 10 to the 15 solar mass stuff would be great to probe uh, uh, deviations in the force law in the background that go out to, say, 10 megaparsecs. That would be great. That encompasses a cluster. It would produce something like uh, a doubling of the number of clusters in this case. But as we get the tests more and more sensitive, what happens in this model is that forces become Newtonian at the largest, deepest gravitational potential wells. There's no excess here. There would be no difference between lensing mass and dynamical mass of clusters. You would pop out things on the group scale. So that's a cautionary note for being too minimal. And this is the same thing that Tristan was pointing out. If you're thinking about this in terms of the space curvature per unit mass, the gamma parameter, you want to probe this on different spatial scales. And you do not want to use your intuition from general relativity to extrapolate, say, from the linear regime what you expect for, say, clusters of galaxies. That is not a good idea. All right, so I ran out of time. Um, so I'll just summarize here. The things that I covered were the ISW effect. The ISW effect contributes at large angles from the change in the gravitational potential. If you go beyond the cosmological constant, it becomes more interesting. So it's a test of exotic models of acceleration, the clustering of the dark energy, modifications of gravity, the microphysics of acceleration, I would say. Compton scattering on hot gas uh, leads you to the thermal SC effect. And this is something that in the kinematics is just the second order Doppler contribution. If you just had a hot gas of uh, uh, electrons much hotter than the photons. Uh, the two limits are if they're unresolved, you get power spectrum contributions that could explain the CBI excess, but stay tuned. And resolved clusters, you can count them uh, out to however high a redshift you have. And if you know their masses, cal can calibrate the masses, you have a, a great handle on the growth rate of structure because of the exponential in the, the um, mass function. And then finally, I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, hopefully, we'll also convince them to, to do this next year. I think they're thinking maybe Cancun. So let's set sail for Cancun. Thank you.